As a fan of the classic monster movies, there will always be a special place in my heart for the likes of Godzilla and Kong, two icons that have more in common than you think. They both come from classic origins, the sci-fi masterpiece about the perils of the nuclear age, Godzilla from 1954, and the RKO special effects giant King Kong from 1933. Now you have a few obvious choices here. We could go Godzilla from 1988. You smell like the fish. I think we should leave now. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I think we want to forget about that one. And then we have the original matchup of the heavyweights, King Kong versus Godzilla. Here it is, folks, the eighth wonder of the black sheep world. By all counts, people either fondly remember this as a childhood staple on VHS, or have no idea the movie existed at all. You know what I'm talking about. King Kong Lives from 1986, a sequel to the 1976 remake of King Kong. Now that big budget film was produced by the same group and even distributed by the same dude, the legendary John Gorman. The remake boasted stars like Jeff Bridges, Charles Grodin, and the first role for Jessica Lange. It was nominated for three Academy Awards, including winning for Best Visual Effects, and it made back nearly quadrupled's budget. But its decade later sequel, King Kong Lives, and eh, not so much, which has been relegated to near obscurity. But why? The King Kong filmography isn't nearly as exhaustive as his nuclear lizard pal. See, there's only been one other sequel that follows his son and not him, and a fun side story on Skull Island that is more or less a reimagining of Zark. And then you have the two big budget remakes. Why double the number of remakes than sequels? Well, I guess, how do you follow such an epic story? And where the hell do you go after the big guy dies? I know, I know, I'm asking a lot of questions here. But you would too, after watching King Kong Lives. The movie takes place uh, approximately 10 years after King Kong. Jack Prescott, Fred Wilson, and Don are, are not only gone, but not even mentioned. In their steed are Linda Hamilton, Brian Kerwin, and the 80s character actor royalty, John Ashton. Seriously, the first two Beverly Hills Cop movies and Midnight Run will keep him in the zeitgeist forever. You know who you're fucking with? No. Why don't you tell me about it? Make sure you're speaking to the microphone. Godspeed, good sir. Godspeed. Now, the only returning character, and, and this is where it, it gets kind of interesting, is Kong himself. And that's right, he didn't die. The movie starts off by showing the ending of the first film. Kong bringing Dawn to the top of the building, only to be shot down and presumably killed. When it fades to black, we are not treated to an end credit sequence, but a fade into the university, where Kong has been in a coma for around a decade. The university has been developing an artificial heart to replace his damaged one, but Hamilton's Dr. Franklin fears he will lose too much blood during the operation. Enter non-copyright infringing Indiana Jones, played by Kerwin. While other characters in the film even joke that Hank Mitchell fancies himself as the famous archaeologist, I'm getting way more of a Michael Douglas romancing the stone vibes personally. In a secluded part of the rainforest, Mitchell stumbles across a female Kong and is able to quickly capture her and sell her to the highest bidder, which happens to be the university housing the male Kong, as they, you know, can't afford to lose him. The problem is that Kong will sense the female and, and lose his mind trying to get to her. Now, after the world's first and only comically large ape open heart surgery, in a scene which is equal parts compelling, gory, and if I'm being honest, a little comical, the king pulls through and is now armed with a powerful artificial heart. When he senses Lady Kong, he breaks out and takes her along with him. Ashton's vengeful colonel is tasked with taking in or taking out the two rogue apes, which sends Franklin and Mitchell on their own mission to find them first. Now here's where the film pushes out a second and far less believable love story of the movie. While the two characters share the same goal and have good chemistry together, it, the speed in which their romance blossoms is almost distracting in its obviousness. The military is able to recapture Lady Kong and seemingly dispatch the king in a death scene that is both silly and sudden. Was the giant rock that killed the beast. The 
Both of our human heroes are exiled from participating in anything to do with the uh, Shikong, but eventually sneak in to find out that she's pregnant, which is a nice little continuity and nods of sorts, if you want to go back and watch the original sequel to the 33 classic, Sun of Kong. We soon find out that Kong is still alive, a surprise to, yeah, no one, and is out to find his lady. With the help of our human couple, quite the double date, Kong and baby mama Kong are able to temporarily get free. The Colonel makes one final effort to take Kong out, and while he does, he pays the ultimate price for messing with the world's largest gorilla. While Kong dies, mainly from his artificial heart, but I'm sure the, uh, you know, hundreds of bullets didn't really help either. And in a sappier note that all of the Kong films are good at pulling off, Kong gets to see his newborn son before passing. It's a nice touch and is followed quickly by the coda of Mrs. Kong and Kong Jr. having a nice place to call their own. The human protagonists and the apes won in this case. It's kind of unexpected. So the question is, what happened to this movie? It didn't do well, for one. It barely made back any of its budget. Linda Hamilton would rather you forget it was ever made, and effectively ruined the great career of director John Gullerman, a director who had huge hits under his belt like Towering Inferno and the 1976 iteration of Kong. One thing that almost certainly hurt it was it, it feels kind of like a kid's movie. Now sure, a lot of kids' first ventures into genre films are with the harmless black and white classics of the Universal Monsters, and of course the 33 original, but that film, as well as the 1976 remake, and hell, even Peter Jackson's reimagining in 05, are not really kids' movies. King Kong Lives, on the other hand, has that almost formulaic Disney process of plot and character progression, but there really isn't any terror here. I mean, the biggest change is how sympathetic Kong is made. His actions in the other films may not always be good, but here, he is certainly the good guy. The other main reason this failed is that there was no want for it at the time. Had they made this movie in 1977 or 78, they would have had the anticipation and ability to piggyback off the success of the Kong remake. So why hasn't this film been rediscovered by a new generation almost 40 years later? It wasn't re-released with Peter Jackson's 05 film, nor is it being talked alongside Skull Island or the Hell in a Cell match between Godzilla and Kong. In a world with more streaming services and streaming options than you would think would be humanly possible, would you care to guess how many of them have hosted this lost film? Yeah, zero. Nada. Now you can buy an old VHS or DVD that at the time of this recording is above 50 bucks, or you can just wait. Wait and hope that someone decides this is worthy to include in the streaming package. So what do we make of this movie? That the very universe is attempting to keep away from us, cult and genre fans. Well, we've been over the less than stellar parts, but let me tell you why you need to see this. First and foremost, King Kong Lives has heart. A big, goofy-looking prosthetic heart, but heart just the same. They could have just easily rehashed all the elements from the previous films and expanded on the story, but instead went in a wholly original direction. You root for him against the military, you root for him against the hillbillies. He doesn't kill anyone until a pack of roving rednecks start to torture and berate him, which is so inhumane that one of the rednecks rebels against his group out of protest for the big fella. And another standout is the score. Kong 76 had a wonderfully put together score by five-time Oscar winner John Barry. But it was also a backdrop to a riveting remake of the top talent and remakeable special effects for the time. In King Kong Lives, John Scott delivers at every chance he gets. The softer love tones when the Kongs are together. The mysterious ambient tracks when Kong is out on his own, and especially the way he revs it up for the final battle between ape and man, and just absolutely kills it. Finally, and I may be going soft in these movies, I really like the hit you over the head metaphor of Kong dying of a broken heart. I don't care, it's cheesy, I know, I know, I don't give a shit. One of the last ways the two humans try and help is to repair his artificial heart because it becomes unstable from overexertion. Once they fail, it's only a matter of time before he will be down for good. Like I said, cheesy? Yeah. Like fine cheddar. But also a cool callback to the ending line of the original. It was beauty killed the beast. At the end of the day, if you want to see a vastly different take on the King Kong mythos, then you could do much worse than King Kong Lives. And you know what? I, I can't see anybody truly going hard against this. Shade! Nah, I'm kidding, I love you, buddy. Do yourself a favor and find it. Pour yourself a cold one, maybe light one up, smoke them if you got them, whatever you gotta do, and enjoy it. And once then, 
do your duty and recommend it to someone else, as long as it is talked about. Even in the inner circles of horror and sci-fi culture, King Kong will truly live. Hey, thanks for watching our show. Please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. Listen, we're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support.